Uh, okay, we were turning our back to the uh, All Ireland Football Final, and I am delighted to say that Niall Morgan is with us this morning. Niall, how are you? <laughs> Not too bad. Great. <laughs> What's it been like? What 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 happened immediately afterwards, and then what was the homecoming like last night? Then. Uh, well, immediately after, obviously there was the the massive sense of relief, and I always wondered how I'd react whenever the final whistle went in All Ireland. That if if we ever got to win, and I know in eighteen it was serious disappointment but uh, just utter relief and um, then we had our we obviously had plenty of celebrations on the pitch and stuff and chain rooms and we had a banquet in Norma City Hotel on Saturday night which was great because uh, it was it was more closed than in 18 it was more just family and friends and um, the, the actual drone setup I suppose and it was a bit more intimate I suppose and people who have also made commitments throughout the year and sacrifices, so it's great to celebrate with them rather than, you know, in 18 there's a lot of empty tables, put it like that, uh, that, that would have been full had we won. Um, and then the homecoming yesterday, we were in Oma and it was an absolute huge crowd. And then we went to the east side of Throne as well to claim Potty Hampsey's hometown and it was just mental. It was, the, the turnout in both places was huge and just it's so surreal what's what's been done the last sort of day and a half it's probably going to be surreal for a while while you um look back on a totally remarkable season all of the different teams that you had to overcome and the quality of footballers that you've beaten and coming through the whole covid stuff so like it, it might take you all a while to process exactly what's happened yeah, well, if I have to think about this every single day for until the the first game of next year, I think I'll be happy enough. So, uh, although we we're back in the, we we're told we have club club games now next Sunday. Uh, we have to we have to finish a league out that has eight games still left in it and at least five weeks of championship. So I think it takes us up to about the <laughs> right eighteenth of December or so. So it'll be, <laughs> it could be a long enough year still to go. Do you do more running for your club or for the Tyrone County team, given your uh, goalkeeper for one and outfield player for the other? <laughs> I think I do more running for Tyrone, even though I play outfield for the club. Uh, they'll probably say that as well. Uh, you, you mentioned there that you, you've always wondered what uh, happens at the full-time whistle, and you mentioned that it's pure relief. Do, do you remember exactly who you run to? You're, you're, you're the first person you see, the first person you hug at the full-time whistle? Uh, I... I, I never really thought about who who I'd run to or anything. I suppose you always just think I'd be the closest person, but end up I just folded myself up like a wee baby and started to cry. <laughs> uh, it was just utter utter relief, and the the feeling was just so good. Uh, I think Petey Hart was the first in the scene then, and maybe McNamee and McKiernan and Hampsey in around the back line, and then just everybody was on the pitch, and it was just great to see the happiness and joy that it brought to everybody's face and. The, the commitments that have been made by everybody throughout the year, through lockdown, training individually. You know, we, we were really rigid in the rules and it's just amazing to, for, to come out this side of it um, and get our just rewards. Does it get spoken about at the start of the season, Niall, the possibility of winning the All-Ireland? Yeah, I think I think every team realistically would be speaking about it. I, I've always said that unless I felt drunk with an All-Ireland, I wouldn't, I wouldn't play because the sacrifices are just too high, um, especially of a young family now, and uh, so it was. It's talked about at the start of the year as like an end goal, but then it's it's put the back burner, and you just take game at the time. I know that sounds very cliche, but that's the way it goes. And I'd say it's the same in every county. Everybody sets out that goal of winning the provincial, and then you know going on to compete in all Ireland. But I suppose with Dublin standings over the last few years, and how how good Kerry were last. Last year, and I suppose they got caught, caught cold by Cork and, and Munster, but um, everybody was sort of talking about them too and how that was going to be the dream final. And then for us to upset Kerry and Mayo to upset Dublin in the semi finals, I think it just set up for a great final. And I think it was a very good match. So, so, is that motivation for you, looking at people saying that that's the dream final, looking at people jumping to conclusions about what the All Ireland final might be? Yeah, well, I suppose being from Throne, you know, Throne weren't used to being in all Ireland finals or anything until the noughties and then we got a wee bit uh, complacent and I suppose thought they were just going to come along all the time and then it took 10 years between 08 and 18 to get to the final. Then we were beaten you're sort of thinking, I know likes of myself as an older player thinking if you'd ever have the chance to get into another one. So 
um, I suppose it does give you a wee bit added motivation and then we in turn suppose maybe maybe we, we enjoy it but we, we feel like we're always written off as you know a team that isn't good enough and now that we don't have Peter Canavan playing for the team anymore it's like he hasn't been for the last uh, 15 years or so that, uh, that we'll never be good enough to compete and uh, I think that's the best thing about our squad this year like we didn't have like that out and out standout player that everybody wants to have in their team and uh, we just had a team of uh, the, the, a collective that, that really wanted to do it for each other and really has that respect and for each other and it's just it's just amazing to come out this side of it with uh, with an All-Ireland that nobody can ever take back. When the final whistle goes and, and you're wrapped up in the fetal position essentially <laughs> what, what are you thinking about? Uh, for me personally and I've thought about it a lot this week and even in the lead up to 18 whenever I was younger I made a promise to my dad after throwing a beat in a backdoor game and he was distraught and I didn't really know what was going on but or the the magnitude of the situation, I made a promise to him that we that I would win all Ireland someday for him, and you know to be able to fulfil that promise was just amazing. And then to be, you know, to have my young children there and to have Christy on the pitch after was just um, great because it it gives him something to look back on, and whenever he's old enough to understand, and hopefully it. You're, you're a role model for him to want to do the same. So it wasn't just that you'd won in the moment, it was that you were fulfilling this promise that you'd made as a kid to your dad. It's, it's kind of, it's, I guess that's the whole thing, isn't it? That no individual victory is won in the moment. It's won on the back of a lifetime of love of the sport, first off, and then the commitment that you make as you go along, and then overcoming all the obstacles that you've had to overcome on the way too. Yeah, definitely. I've been playing... Gaelic from when I was maybe three or four years of age. Dad had me, he was a big coach, well, big into the coaching in the club, the youth coaching. And um, like dad wouldn't have been a, a great footballer. He wouldn't have played much senior football or anything for the club. So um, he had me up from a young age. And I suppose like all them years of putting in practice with, with Eden Dark and uh, to finally ful- fulfill, you know everything that you've ever uh, sacrificed and it's just it's just amazing it's so hard to put into words how to how describe how you feel the other thing Niall is that you've been a risk taker along the way that um, you know when, when you're coming out of goals and you're soloing the ball you can hear the crowd They're, like everybody can hear the crowd going what what what's going on here oh and you have to ignore that and you've managed to ignore that for the best part of a decade to a point where uh, it's now normalised that you're in the half back line or in midfield pinging balls, pinging through balls through for McCurry to run onto and nearly score goals from. That evolution and that process, it's a remarkable journey to go on because we know that Irish people are innately conservative when it comes to innovators in sport in particular. We're suspicious of them. We, we're, we don't get behind them and go, yeah, you go and you be you. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? So <laughs> there's a bit of, I presume there's a bit of relief in all that coming to fruition too at the end. Yeah, big time. Um, whenever I started out playing for the club in 2008, I played outfield for the first few games and then uh, they moved me back into goals and they sort of played me in a bit of a sweeper role at that stage. Now, I'd have been playing more nearly man marking the full forward and the full back would have played out in front. Whereas with throwing now, it's a wee bit different. And uh, Mickey sort of gave me the license to go and do it and, and try it out. And I uh, played it for the club a couple of years ago as well, whenever the our goalkeeper was in Scotland at university. And then Fergal and Brian came in this year and they were, were happy for me to do the same. Now, they did sort of say at the start, maybe not to, not to go as much. Um, but uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We got caught in Kerry a few times in Killarney in the in the league. Uh, got lobbed in the first half. And then, then it's well, you're going to take the risk again. But... To me, it, it pays off. I've, I've cut out a number of balls in the last couple of seasons. Uh, and then the one at the weekend that nearly led to Darren's goal in the first half. But again, the first half, only for Ron McNamee's block, I was well off. Uh, my line is scrambling back whenever O'Shea took the shot, so it could have been very, very different. 
What's really interesting, Niall, is that you've been part of this group of goalkeepers that have brought the position to, to a whole new level. But with that has come a whole new level of profile as well, that this generation of goalkeepers are just more notable than, than previous goalkeepers in terms of, in terms of their name and, and fame and all that. And like even if you go back to your first championship season in, in 2013, I think most people will remember that, that game in Bally Buffet where you maybe miss a few frees here and there and it's a, it's a tough day for you. I think you're, you're cupping your ears to the crowd and all that. But you seem to embrace being in the spotlight in that moment. You didn't shy away from it. You continued to take the freeze. You continued to take risks. And you pushed the boat out even further this year. I presume that takes a whole pile yeah, of mental yeah. toughness. And what goes through your head? Yeah, I think like like everybody, I have myself doubts as well. And that game in Buffet that year was just a horrendous experience and you know but it was something that that made me learn that I have to sort of you know yes focus on the game and take risks as as they come but I reacted to the crowd that day like and that shouldn't have happened um but like a lot of people would talk about me bottling big kicks and big games and you know um I've missed a lot of kicks to either equalize or win matches but you know I've always said that if somebody puts her hand up and asks me to come up and, and take it, I'll, I'll always give it my best. And sometimes it comes off and sometimes it doesn't. And thankfully on on Saturday, you know, we kicked three from three, which was a big thing for me because to do that in an All-Iron final, that's the biggest stage um, to not miss. And for kickouts to go well, apart from the, the very first one, it's a, you, you do have self-doubt and it's, it's nice to, you know, prove to yourself more than anybody else that the commitment and the sacrifice is all worth it because pe- people have doubted me from from that first year and people have questioned my mental toughness and uh, said that I'm flaky and, you know, that I can be got at. And I've heard it from other county players of different teams saying that that I would be targeted by them in, in games because they feel like it depressed me. And there was articles after the Kerry game saying that my kickouts malfunctioned. And, you know, it's just, I just thought that was... Uh, I thought it was kind of funny in a way because like I'd done literally what I was told and that was get the ball long and play the ball in Kerry's half and every one of my kickouts went exactly where I wanted it to go and um, unfortunately it's not up to me to be, be up there to get the break ball as well but sometimes you just have to do what you're told and I, I'm glad that I did and yes I had the horrible kick out of my hands in, in the second half which put us under pressure and it nearly led to a carry goal, but to, to be judged as a, as a goalkeeper for miss hitting a kick out of your hands uh, whenever you're trying to get the ball from your own 45 into the forward line, I thought it was a bit, it was a bit uh, funny, as I say. So, uh, look, I'm more than happy to, to take the, the criticism as it comes and take uh, the praise with a pinch of salt and know that it's the, the great saying of you're only a pat in the back's only a few inches away from a kick in the ass. So, uh, it's 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 just great to to finally get over the line. How do you manage to use that to th- those criticisms as motivation for yourself? Because a lot of people with a thinner skin than you would allow it to affect to affect them in a negative way. So, are you talking to people in the camp? Are you are you bouncing these ideas or are these articles off people? And are you getting positive feedback from them, which allows your own confidence to subsequently grow? Uh, the the throne camp this year is just you know it's so it's so personable and that they can nearly sense whenever you're in bad form or whenever you do need to pick me up and you know I've been pulled aside a few different times and just probably told what I needed to hear uh, without even having to go and seek it out and you know at the same time I've been told a few home truths throughout the year as well which I need to be told at the right times as well uh, but I remember seeing a quote. Uh, I'm not big well I, I like seeing different quotes and stuff but I'm not big into them uh, but it just said about pro- proving to yourself rather than proving to others and you know prove yourself right you know all I want to do is prove myself right that you know all my sacrifices walking out of the ha- home house here and leaving two children behind three or four times a week is, is worth it rather than you know I'm not going to start name dropping people and say that I'm pr- proving him wrong or him wrong it, it, it just doesn't you know, I couldn't care what they think of me. And I think people are starting to understand that, that I'm a mo- my own person. And, you know, if if you like me, great. If you don't like me, you know, I don't really care because I'm not going to go out trying to please you or to, to prove anything to you. It's it's 
it's about proving myself right and proving, uh, I suppose, to Fergal and Brian that their faith in me uh, is warranted. How did you guys keep going then? You know, you talked about losing the All Ireland final before. You've lost All Ireland, All Ireland semi finals before. What was it that gave you the belief? You know, you said earlier on, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think we were going to be able to win in All Ireland. Why did you keep going after those dark days? Do you think? I just always felt that there was there was more in the team, and uh, I think if you look at a lot of the games, uh, there was always that moment in the game that that turned it against us. Um, and a lot of the time it was out of our own doing. In the 18 final, we were well ahead. Um, we sort of switched off before half time. I had a bad kick out led to the penalty. And it sort of everything turned on that. In the, the, the 2015 semi final, there was the goal chance, t- two goal chances in the game that we didn't take. In 19, it was, you know, the carry breaking from, from their own half and getting the goal. and. In, in uh, 17, obviously, Dublin demolished us in the semi-final and I suppose that was the hardest year to come back from because you were thinking, like, we are so far behind Dublin, it's crazy. But uh, I just always had that belief and I suppose maybe that promise to, to my dad was always ringing in my head and I didn't want to be seen as a quitter and somebody who gave up uh, on a dream just because uh, they felt they were a wee bit behind. It would have been very easy for me to go back to the soccer but a lot of teams in the Irish League contacted me each year to... To go back, but like, yeah, I have that. I had that dream as a child that I wanted to win All Ireland, and I made that promise. And I suppose I really wanted to fulfil it. And and now you have. Can I, you you mentioned the the Kerry game, and it, it keeps coming up actually in the aftermath of uh, of all of the interviews that everybody's done since you won. Everybody talked about the the Kerry game in the league. Um, what changed? What what specifically do you think changed after that? Was there a, a, a shift in tactics? Were you trying something specific that day? Were there mad training sessions on the morning of the game? All the conspiracy theories are out there, Niall. No, we, we definitely didn't train the morning of the game. That's That was a mad statement to come out with. I think that was somebody maybe trying to cover for how bad we were. Uh, whenever we arrived down the Friday night, we went to the, the National Park for basically a stretch. We were on a bus for seven hours and we went and got the footballs out and had done a bit of fist passing and we we had our we had our boots on but it was literally if if we I'd say the walk from the bus to the to the grass patch that we used was was more than any distance that we we covered uh, on the grass um but it was just maybe a wee bit of naivety from ourselves we sort of went down and we had a we had done all right in the the three games against the Ulster teams and. Everybody was talking up Kerry, and we sort of thought, "Look, we'll just we'll go down here, and we we'll give them a game." And you know, we did believe that we could beat them, but now that was a day of the kickout malfunction. Uh, if you if you want to go go and see kickout malfunction, uh, we got absolutely wiped. We tried to go short, they pressed us. Uh, then we tried to go long, and we couldn't get bodies near breaks, and uh, we just we played into Kerry's hands so much that day. And I think whenever it came to back to training on the Tuesday night. Uh, there was a lot of home truths and boys just had to take it in the chin and and realise the, the deficiencies that we had and we we worked really hard in the in training then in the, the lead up to the Ulster Championship and uh, thankfully it, it paid off in them games like you know we, we beat the, the reigning Ulster Champions on the first day we beat Donny Gall who we've really struggled against in, in Ulster Championship in recent years and then we beat Monaghan who we've also struggled against in Ulster Championship so it was a it was a massive uh, it was a massive Ulster championship for us. Never mind to then turn around and beat Kerry and, and Mayo, who we have also struggled against big time in championship. Like that was the first time I'd ever beat either of the two of them in a championship game. So it's uh, it's it's down to the hard work that the boys, especially like the outfielders, the work they put in uh, on a Tuesday and Thursday night is just. It's mental just seeing them and like I'm going back to the club now to, to mark some of them in, in, the, in the coming weeks and just thinking how, you know, it's it's one thing whenever you're jogging about and you go on a wee run up the pitch every now and again, but to have to turn around and mark one of these boys now in the next couple of weeks. Is, they have to take it easy on you though, because you're very, you're very important for them next year if they want to win another All-Ireland. So just just point that out at the first, first few minutes. Uh, uh, it's own club football. <laughs> it's a, a whole different game. Yeah. Uh, even if we had a game uh, in a fortnight's time, they would still be cutting lumps out of each other next Sunday. So it's a it's very parochial. It's it's very competitive. We have a knockout championship up here. Straight knockouts. You only get one chance, and it's just 
it's hell for leather from the start. And I think there's a few games on TV last year that gave people an insight into what club football yeah. is like in throwing. Yeah, well, really high yeah. quality, like very skillful and incredibly intense. Can I just ask about the McCurry goal? Are you picking out Con Kilpatrick with that kick out or does it just happen to be, you know, you, you can back him in a 50-50? Is that, are you specifically aiming at him, I suppose is my question. Yeah, well, like obviously I, me, Con and Darren are the same club and I know what Con's capable of and uh, he had sort of said to me in, uh, before the game that he, he fancied his chances in the air and if I needed a, a go-to kick out, just put it on top of them and uh, it might have sounded a wee bit uh, cocky of him, like, but uh, I see him doing it week in, week out for the club and uh, I suppose I just seen that we need to kick out to go long and he was the, the longest option and I just sent it down to have him. I was sort of more thinking if even if we can pick up a break ball because Mayo were, were rightly pushed up at that stage that we, we might get a bit of a counter and he, you know, he got up and he caught it, um, caught it clean had the awareness to dish it off really quickly and then I don't even know how Connor seen Darren because he, uh, I haven't watched the back fully yet but I don't even think he looks at him and no. he does the perfect pass and you know that's that's something that Connor McKenna brings to us because he's done it in training on a number of occasions even like I've went in a few forays up the pitch in training and he's picked me out with passes whenever I think that he, he hasn't even seen me um, and I suppose maybe it's coming from the, the AFL where he's got more bodies around him and you know, a different style of attack and he has to be more aware of getting the ball out of difficult situations. But, uh, you know, a lot of people maybe expected Connor to come back and hit one six, one seven every game, but he's been absolutely unbelievable. His work rate is tracking back. He's great out ball for me for kickouts. And, you know, that vision again, as I say, is just it's class and the two goals in the, the semi-final as well, just sort of summed him up as well. Uh, in the middle of the um, COVID stuff that was going on, was there any part of you that was concerned that actually the game mightn't go ahead and that could be the end of your season? Yeah, we we made the call after training on the, the basically the day that it came out that we were going to pull out and we, we had a real tough training session and then Fergal and Brian pulled us in after and said that basically that, that was it. They, they'd made the call based on the health guidelines that or the health guidance, sorry, that they, they'd received from a uh, top-end uh, medical officer in Dublin that, you know, the team would not, definitely not be fit to play the next week. And I suppose we just had to we had to go with it. We, we, we did have a, a tough discussion for 10 or 15 minutes over it, boys given uh, different points of view on it. And some boys still wanted to play, but we made the decision that if we were going to do this, we're going to do it together. And, uh, like, if we had went down the following week, we would have maybe had... You know, twenty fit players. If if that, like you know, and then you were taking, you're going to have to take risks on boys that had got uh, COVID in the the week leading up to it, and it just, you know, it is a, it is a pandemic. It is a health emergency at the end of the day, and we have had our tragedies up here the same way everybody else has. So it was it was kind of disappointing the way people called us out as if you know we were trying to cheat the system. You know, we we. It did work out in our favour in the end, but you know, Crook Park had the right to turn around and say, "Well, look, if you're pulling out, you're pulling out." It was it was them that gave us the the lifeline and the extra game, and to be fair to Kerry coming out as well and saying they were willing to play. So, uh, we we made a very tough call, and thankfully it, it turned around and worked in our favour. There was a, a short period of time. It, was, it wasn't it wasn't insignificant though, where you're officially out of the championship, saying we can't play. It's it's back to Crook Park now, and you're waiting for for that hearing what's the feeling in the pit of your stomach at that point are you confident that actually the right thing will be done or is there a fear that like Jesus this could be it well we, we knew it was the right thing to do for a start um, you know sometimes in life you have to stand up and, and you know say that what we're doing is the right thing to do and um, I'm a big believer in stand up for yourself and stand up for what you believe um, and you know, we took that stance and it was a hard stance to take and, you know, you were, you knew that you were going to be questioned throughout the county, like if, if and the country, you knew if, if Crow Park had a turn around and gave Kerry a, a buy into the final that you were, you were taking away probably the integrity of the competition, but it was a, it was a stance we had to take and it, it definitely was the right one and, you know, yes, there was a relief when we got back in, but 
there was many club managers uh, sending text messages asking when when we were going to be at training. So <laughs> uh, the, the, I think some of them were happy enough uh, if, if it had been pulled. Always um, priorities but, when it comes to the club managers, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know yourself what it's like. So see you next week. Um, uh, yeah, well, they were. Uh, that we had made that statement on the Saturday and I think some clubs asked for their players to be there on a Sunday morning, believe it or not. <laughs> and so, uh, Fergal, Fergal made it quite clear that, you know, if we're taking the stance, you're not, you're not available for your club yeah, this fair week. Enough. <laughs> and, um, you can't play for no the point we, we can't play a game next next weekend and then everybody go, returning to play for their club. So um, that, that would have been good crack trying to tell the club managers, yeah, we're out of the championship now, but no, we're not going to bother coming to training and play for you next weekend. And in a weird way, Niall, you said that there was a you know, tense 10, 15 minute conversation there where the management have decided this and they're breaking the news to the players and some of the players are like, no, 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 we're going to go. And in a weird way, having that conversation, like it has to be intense because... As you've talked about, you're leaving your family, your young kids, you know, three, four times a week to go and do this thing. And then management have said, actually, you know, we've got we've got science now that says we don't think we're going to be able to do ourselves justice. Being able to have that afterwards to look back on where everybody was given the opportunity to say what they thought, that gives a great sense of unity and purpose. I, I suppose that there was an honesty in the room where that strength of feeling emerges. Definitely, uh, I think I mentioned that earlier about how honest the setup has been in terms of you know calling a spade a spade if boys needed to told things. Uh, the management weren't afraid to to call them out, and it didn't matter whether you were the I suppose the the more senior experienced players like myself or Matty or PD, right down to the the new lads into the team. The ma- the management treated everybody exactly the same, and I think you know it would have been very easy for them to pull like a a small leadership group or even just. Kieran and Potty as vice captain and captain into a, a room and let them go and break into the players and not give us a say. But uh, we were in a huddle, the the whole background team, the management team, the players, we were all there. And um, there was boys started off sitting on the grass just thinking that it was going to be the normal end of training uh, team talk. And then there was a few of them started standing up and stepping forward a wee bit more uh, keenly and sort of they had their say and you know but at the end of the day it, it came down to being about the team and being about everybody rather than individuals looking their day out in Croke Park and everybody uh, bought into it and was happy that that was the decision that was being made and that was the way it was going to go and don't get me wrong Fergal and Brian did offer the chance and said look if if it's really strongly felt in here that that you want to go and play with what we've got you know we'll go with that decision as well but we made the agreement that it just wouldn't be worth it with, you know, you were, you were going down, you weren't going to do yourself justice. You were probably going to have to call in boys who weren't even part of the panel to uh, take part. And, you know, I've seen some people saying, surely there's there's 20 players in throne they can play like, but, you know, we had, we had been down in Killarney weeks, weeks before and with the full team and got an absolute annihilation. And there would have been absolutely no point in going to Croke Park uh, with, with half a team or, or less and, and getting worse on this on a bigger stage. It's an incredible story, Not like even irrespective of the COVID aspect of it, but the bit where this team has come back under the new management team in their first season and played a style of football that was uh, capable of dealing with every single challenge and particularly the point you made about, you know, you haven't beaten those guys in, in the past in the championship. It's a remarkable story. You've been brilliant with your time this morning, Niall. You've had an incredible season. I don't know, are you? has it sunk in just how good your own season has been yet? You're in the, the conversation, at least for Footballer of the Year. You were in conversation for Man of the Match in an All-Ireland final. To reach that level at this stage of your career must be very fulfilling. Definitely. I think I alluded to it earlier that people have have doubted me the whole way through and there always is something to pick on me about. And... It's just, you know, I might be playing the pity card there, but that's sort of how it felt at the time. So, you know, to finally uh, prove that, you know, again to myself that everything's been worth it and uh, to be in in the conversation for player or man of the match and, you know, I know I'm well outside the, the bracket for footballer of the year, but to be even... Uh, I'd, I'd mentioned with uh, my name in the same sentence is just unbelievable and I'm just I'm, I'm, it might sound silly but I'm delighted for myself that, that it finally has uh, all the 
sacrifice have, have you know, came to fruition, I suppose. And the, the, the most important thing is the, that I've got a Celtic cross now. And no matter what anybody says about me as an individual or about us as a team now, nobody can ever take that away from us. 2021 is going to be forever remembered as, as Throne being all Ireland champions. And, and that's, that's all that matters to me and all that matters to all the team. It's in the books now, as you said. Nobody can ever take it away from you. Niall, thanks a million for joining us. No problem, thank you. And congratulations. It's uh, Niall Morgan there. Um, just a really interesting character, a really interesting part of Gaelic football history now. And, you know, everybody talks about how Cluxon changed the game, but himself and Rory Began have taken that and they've run with it. Cluxon was never really a sweeper-keeper, even though there's that one famous instance that we always talk about in the kick-out against... Um, against Kerry and uh, you know when it's happening in club matches in Tyrone there's a petri dish of uh, high level thinking going on around Gaelic football particularly in the Ulster Football Championship and he's a sweeper keeper for his club in 2008 you know when he's talking about it it's, this is not a recent development OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razor